the fact that Mars is within reach broadly and of chemical rockets correct of current technology of current physics mm -hmm. and we do it hooray super hard we did it interplanetary right but your point is that oh it seems like uh that is insufficient and also kind of like a false duck type scenario where we did it, but we didn't actually do the thing we needed to do. So we may have even been better off had the nearest, closest planet been two light years away. Assume Mars didn't exist. Correct. And yep. assume that Elon yep. was still the visionary that we want him to be. And he didn't have a chemical rocket company. I'd like to think that he would be focused on physics. I would like to think that any of these people would be focused on physics. Take anybody with 11 figures. What is your allocation to building a, a life raft to get humans out of here? You, don't, you haven't even thought about it. Immediately, you'll, you're going to think technology. Well, what kind of a hole would I need? It's like, no. You need a blackboard. You need blackboards and physicists who are not afraid to do physics. Right now, we are destroying the fundamental physics community at a rate that you could not believe. What's happening? Give, give me the gossip from inside. For 39 years, we've been dominated by one community's madness. And that community is called quantum gravity, string theory, or M theory. It changed what we were researching. It's, it's cardinal sin is not about string theory. It's not about quantum gravity. It changed the questions that meant defined what it meant to be a fundamental physicist. So if I say to you, how many generations of matter are there? I don't know. You don't know that it's three because we don't talk about that all the time anymore. Or if I say, do you know why, why is matter chiral? You wouldn't know about that. Or if I said, what's the nature of the quartic potential for the Higgs field? Or why is there a Yukawa coupling in one case and a minimal coupling somewhere else? All of the real physics questions that would cause progress got subtly replaced between 1984 and like 1987. And then we had questions like, how do we quantize gravity? And that became this, oh, that is the ultimate question. Well, it's, it's not. That's, that's just wrong. This comes out of Bryce DeWitt. This comes out of a guy who in 1952 went with his wife to the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bombay, then wrote an essay for something called the Gravity Research Foundation that was about anti-gravity. And they, he was supposed to write an essay. And then he said, well, to get anti-gravity, what you'd really need to do is to do quantum gravity. And for 70 years, we've been trying to do quantum gravity, and it's an abject failure. And the physicists at the, at the helm changed the questions, the, the official questions should sound something like this. Why are there three generations of matter? Why is it flavor chiral? What is the nature and the origin of the Higgs mechanism? Why are we in one comma three dimensions? And what is with SU3 cross SU2 cross U1, which is a bunch of symmetries? And why does it seem to represent on a 16 dimensional space with the observed quantum numbers? And that may not mean a lot to you, but I guarantee you if there are physicists in the audience, they're getting pissed off right now because they allowed their, their subject to be dragged away from our real questions for reasons that are unclear and put in the service of these questions that can't be answered. And we can't even question them 39 years into this complete train wreck that is the community that could build the life raft. What is so seductive about quantum everything? Quantum gravity? Yeah. It allows for toy problems so that you can not do your work on the, the world that we have. And you can say, well, the world that we have is too complicated. So I created this fake world over here that's not in four dimensions. It's in two dimensions. It's not in Lorentzian signature. It's in Euclidean signature. It's not the full gauge group. Uh, it's just SU2. And I've changed all the parameters. <laughs> and then I say, and I've made some minor incremental progress in that fake world. And then everybody claps. And meanwhile, 10 years later, you don't even remember what the particles are that are present in the universe. You don't even remember the, the standard model of particle theory. And this is a, a very real effect. Today's physicists, a lot of the young ones, are completely ignorant 
about the physical world. They could not find the men's or women's room at CERN uh, if their life depended on them. Yeah, so it seems like a hijacking of attention and focus from difficult problems to from useful difficult problems to useless or less useful easier problems but if you try to talk about the real problems you can't get engagement and they will say it as uh well maybe people just aren't interested in your ideas i was like yeah but you're not listening to so far as i can tell everybody who comes from outside with an interesting new idea isn't being listened to it's not personal and we also have a responsibility. This is like, this is a really crazy part. We doomed humanity. Like Francis Crick, who was a co-discoverer of the three-dimensional structure of DNA, was a physicist. Edward Teller was a physicist. Stanislav Ulam was a geometer. We doomed humanity on Earth. And then we're treating science as if Oh, it's a series of puzzles. Well, what do you want to work on today? Well, I don't want to be arrogant. I'll just work on this tiny little problem. And, and I'm just thinking, like, do you, do you not feel any <laughs> basic responsibility after Hiroshima and Nagasaki and COVID? All right. Just how crazy are you? Is that, you know, we've spoken about the interplanetary challenge. Right. And the fact that, Physics needs to make some progress in order to facilitate that if we're going to do it. Yeah. Is, in your opinion, forgetting the fact that chemical rockets, right. limitations, all that sort of stuff, is going into planetary as useful? I I is it the highest priority? The highest priority. You'll, you, you cannot stabilize this place. Just imagine every communalist dream came true. We turned away from fossil fuels towards a, the greenest new deal you could possibly imagine. All billionaires realized the errors of their ways and contributed their money to bring up the poorest of the poor. AI was as beneficial as it could be and only helped humanity to live its dream. Just go full, wild Pollyanna optimism. You still can't stabilize it. Why? Um... Too many people, not too for much long. lever. Say more. Not for long. Population rates, birth rates at the moment. We're talking at totally different scales. I'm telling you that with CRISPR Cas9, with the Teller Ulam design, IVG, IVG. You know IVG? Uh, -uh. IVF, but being uh -oh. able to use from any other. Sure. Yep. Uh, so I was trying to, I was trying to think, uh, in a different context, you are going to have, um, people, w what happens when you distribute the coronavirus because everybody's had it, you've had it. I w got an antibody test and I had it, but yeah. never felt it. Okay. So, yeah. so you have this, this plat platform this virus viral platform that's spread all over the world and you have the ability to edit it are you telling me that people aren't going to figure out how to come up with fun viruses and gain of function projects and people are going to be able to do these uh you know prol polymerase chain reaction i think was taught in my daughter's high school are you familiar with uh Nick Bostrom's balls from the urn analogy. Yeah, vaguely. Yeah, so for the people that don't know, you can imagine that you, you have an urn, and each time that you make technological progress, you pick a ball out, and you don't know what color. Some are white, perfectly good. Yep. Some are gray, bit of good, bit of bad, and some are all the way down to black. And black is permanent, unrecoverable collapse. Right. And the unrecoverable bit is important. Yep. And each time we just keep picking out balls. So my take on it is there's already too much leverage, too much leverage, too little wisdom, too many people. What was it that you once said? Uh, we are gods, but for the wisdom, we're just shitty gods. I don't know if I said the second part, but, um, you know, I, 
I guess when I heard the story about this kid who scavenged the americium from all of these smoke detectors in Brooklyn and built a self-sustaining nuclear reactor from these tiny little radioactive strips, you don't know what people's creativity is. You, you know, I found it fascinating when I was growing up that I was the only kid who knew that gunpowder or black powder was 75% potassium nitrate, 10% sulfur, and 15% carbon. Like, you could just make it you know? And, uh, you know, that's the recipe. And that, that just blew my mind that the rate limiting step was that people didn't know that potassium nitrate was saltpeter or where to get it. It's yep. like meat tenderizer, but mostly we're saved from this stuff because nobody's so sociopathic and competent that they go for these high leverage attacks. That's going to end. You know, that was like what happened on 9-11. I always wanted to know why were little kids allowed to go into the cockpit of a plane? You used to be able to meet the pilot. I, I remember meeting I remember, the pilot. I remember doing it, yeah. So that's where we're, we are now is, is that we've got all this high leverage stuff and you're going to see nuclear proliferation. Eventually, you're going to get some despot backed into a corner who says, well, this is my only move. Well, I mean, for the nuclear concernists out there, at least what I know. Wouldn't that be all of us? Everybody is concerned. But for the people that are, nuclear war is a genuine X risk, permanent yeah. unrecoverable collapse. Uh -huh. You can set them all off unless there's like f 10 to 100 times more than we think that we have, which there very well could be. Um, it seems difficult for it to be permanent unrecoverable collapse for okay. me as a true, 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 true X risk. May I say something? Yeah. This is ridiculous. It's bad enough that it would completely transform life as we know it. You'd mm -hmm. agree with that, that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's time, it's time to get serious about things we can actually do. And the most interesting thing is that nobody's interested in interplanetary physics. I, I just, I've never seen anything like it. Interplanetary physics would be physics in service of us becoming interplanetary or is there something specific about the way that planets figure together no no this? no it's it's about let, let me give you an analogy that's more than an analogy assume that somebody hands you a physical paper map an, an enormous one okay and you're trying to navigate it on this table that we're we have here you're starting to do motions like this where you're moving the paper across the table you know, to get from Los Angeles to Fresno, California, if it's at the right scale. And it might take you a long time to do that. Okay, but now you have somebody trained on an iPad. What are they going to do? Well, they might do that, but that's not the key thing they're going to do. They're going to do what is called multi multi-touch gestures. And the one that you're thinking of should be pinch to zoom. So the most natural way to do this is to treat it not as if it's a paper map, but a stack of paper maps, and you want to go to the a, one with a different scale. If if you were doing this on an iPad that was mirroring this, the key point is is that the paper map doesn't have an extra dimension to play with, but the pinch to zoom dimension is a scale dimension. So imagine what you did instead was you looked at your house, you pinched to zoom out. You then do this motion or whatever it is to get to your friend's house. And then when you land there, you expand it again. Imagine that you only know about paper maps, but your adversary has an iPad. That's what I'm worried about. We're not looking for pinch to zoom. What would that be in this? Um, well, I claim that there are going to be 10 extra coordinates. and four of them uh, are pinched to zoom and six of them are what I would call um, sheer to tilt. So imagine that you have a copy of a picture of, of the uh, Leaning Tower of Pisa on your iPad. You should be able to do something in paint which changes the angle, right? So if you go into MS Paint, there's this little thing that allows you to change by a particular angle. But you could do that as a gesture where so my claim is if you have four dimensions of time, 
and X, Y, and Z of space, you have pinch to zoom on all of all four of those. And then for any two dimensions like X and Z, you have shear to tilt. So the, the first are the four rulers and the next are the six protractors. And that's something called a symmetric two tensor or a metric, which Einstein knew all about, but he only chose one through his equations and he let all the other ones lie fallow. And my claim is, I don't think that's where we are. I think that interplanetary physics is going to involve moving from what we called space-time to something called the observerse, which contains pinch to zoom and shear to tilt. And you want to get off this planet, you're not going to get there using general relativity, and you're not going to get there using the standard model. It's time to take your pacifier out of your mouth and go back to doing real physics. I think if we were serious about this, we would be struggling with the physics of the world in which we live, not toy models. We'd be taking massive risks and listening to people from various perspectives who haven't failed or have not been invited to fully explain their ideas. And we'd be looking for things that would be new, new variables, new ways of working with the world that allowed us to do things that were previously considered inconceivable. So if you, if you look at 1911, which is when I think Rutherford first starts talking about the neutron as a hypothesis. It's 41 years later, we have um, the hydrogen bomb. We can do incredible things that are not possible yet because we don't know the framework. And my claim is, if you imagine somebody used to paper maps being put on an iPad and not knowing about multi-touch gestures, that is pretty much an exact analogy of what happens when you do too much general relativity, mm -hmm. is that you start to think in general relativistic terms as if that's the last word. Einstein would never have put up with that. We'll get back to talking to Eric in one minute, but first I need to tell you about Cozy Earth. Look, we spend one third of our lives asleep. You do not want to spend 33% of your existence inside of sheets that do not make you feel amazing. Cozy Earth has the best quality bedding. It's not just about what you sleep on, it is what you sleep under. And the quality of your sheets make a massive difference to the quality of your sleep. Sleep is the ultimate game changer and improving your sheets will improve your sleep quality. Cozy Earth is a premium bedding and loungewear company where they make the best quality bedwear. The products are made from super soft viscose from highly sustainable bamboo. The temperature regulating so you'll sleep cool all year round. Best of all, they've got a 10-year warranty on all of their products. That's how confident they are that they'll last. You can get an exclusive 35% discount site-wide on everything from Cozy Earth by going to cozyearth.com slash modernwisdom and using the code modernwisdom35 at checkout. Cozyearth.com slash modernwisdom and modernwisdom a checkout. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that clip with Eric, then press here for the full length three hour episode. Go on. Press it.